We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we praise Him, and we bear witness that there is no God but one God, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, and we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is His prophet and messenger. He conveyed the message, he showed us the straight path that would lead us to success in this world and in the hereafter. May Allah's peace and blessings and salutations be upon His dear and beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. We thank Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, for all the blessings that we enjoy, inwardly and outwardly. The blessings that we know of and the blessings that we don't even know. And indeed, the blessings of Allah upon us that we don't know about far exceeds the blessings of Allah that we know of. But yet, with that which we know, we still are not thanking Allah enough. May Allah forgive us for our shortcomings. And may Allah accept the very little ibadah and thankfulness and gratitude that we have towards Him. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. My dear brothers and sisters, when one today cannot help with this time, but to almost feel guilty enjoying any of Allah's blessings, seeing what our brothers and sisters have endured for 14 months in Gaza, and what caught after that of pain and suffering in Lebanon and were caught before that the pain and suffering for years in Syria, Libya, Yemen, Iraq and before that in Afghanistan, in Kashmir for a long time and now even it's spreading all over India for the pain and suffering of our brothers and sisters from Burma, the Rohingyas from our brothers and sisters from East Turkestan, which is the Uyghurs, which in my judgment have the hardest test in the entire Muslim world. I am Palestinian. I lost my entire family in Gaza. But hands down, the test of our brothers and sisters in China, in Xinjiang, the new province, which historically has never ever been, never ever been part of historical China. The East Turkestan took their independence twice in 1936 and uh, from the British and then they took their 1945 from the Russians but then uh, when Stalin, Joseph Stalin created the Soviet Union he thought that that was too far so he gifted East Turkestan which was under the Soviet Union Russian influence he gifted it to China to Mao Zedong at that time uh, to you know show a gesture because uh, he demanded so much from Mao Zedong and didn't give him back anything in return did it little did Russia or China know that Xinjiang will be the heart and the body of where all the oil is and where all the uh, natural gas is and when all the uh, minerals and even they're finding lithium there which is very important for cars like electric cars and batteries subhanallah the people there they're fought in their deen you cannot say la ilaha illallah you cannot pray five times a day the husband and the father is in jail and the mother and the family they have a, fi a family someone who's a junior 18 years old less than 18 Chinese secret service lives with your wife and children in their house what's their job to make sure nobody speaks native tongue nobody says salamu alaikum nobody prays five times a day that they have alcohol in the house that they eat pork that they sing the national anthem inside the house this is the hardest test I will take the test of the people of Gaza all day long and I'll die shaheed fi sabilillah but I would not want to be in jail with my wife and children with a foreign man living with them in the house and then finally you know bribing and forcing and in extorting the Muslim girls that if they marry Chinese Hans from the other race that they will release their parents one of the saddest stories 14 Muslim girls said yes and they all made an agreement and a pact between them and once they released the parents the 14 girls all committed suicide in one night at their wedding night 
because they did not want to sleep with a, someone who's not a Muslim and have children. A woman gets raped once in her lifetime and she will never forget it and suffer for the rest of her life. Imagine being raped every night by someone who claims himself to be your husband. The, the plight of our brothers and sisters, the Uyghurs, is, is above and beyond. So my, I just say, Ya Allah, accept the little Islam from them. In jail, the husband is forced to drink alcohol, the worst quality of alcohol, and eat pork, and sing the national anthem five times instead of praying five times. And they're not allowed to say, Salaamu Alaikum, or any word in Arabic or any word in, uh, in, in their Uyghur language, which is a Turkic language. Uh, it's, it's the old Turkish. So they understand the Turkish people, but the Turkish language is a new Turkish. This is the old Turkish, the Turkic uh, language, subhanAllah. So when we see these brothers and sisters worldwide, you know, when you drink clean water right now, you feel guilty for what's happening in Gaza. When you eat a good meal, you feel guilty. When you go to sleep secure in your house with your wife and children, you feel guilty. When you take your child to the hospital because they're sick and you're so worried and there's 15 doctors that can see him, specialist, you feel guilty. But the point for us, that Allah Azza wa gave us things that we can do. Always Allah asks of us what we can do. On the short run, four things we can do. One is very powerful, which is making dua to Allah Azza wa and never to forget. With every meal you say, Bismillah, Ya Allah, feed the Muslims of Gaza and Sudan and, and, and Lebanon and in Iran and everywhere. Ya Allah, feed them like you fed us. Everywhere, our brothers and sisters in Yemen, Libya, wherever there is a poor Muslim, every time after Salah, you make dua for them. You all know that the Prophet ﷺ, when three tribes, Adil, Waqarra, wa Kulayb, they asked the Prophet, give us uh, people that will teach us Quran. So he sent for them the cream of the crop of Ashabu Sufa. The Prophet was happy. Three tribes want to learn Quran, he sent them 70 Sahabi. When they left Medina and got close to them, they killed all of them. Seventy hafiz of the Quran. Raised by the Prophet ﷺ. Top-notch hafiz, top-notch taqwa, top-notch tazkiya, tarbiya, you name it. The Prophet ﷺ heart was so boiling, for one month he made dua al-qunut after ruku' of the fourth rak'ah. One month. And this incident took one day. The largest concentration of Huffad in the world is in Gaza. 25,000 Hafid. The largest number of Masajid in 25 miles by 5 miles is in Gaza. 1,355 Masajid within 25 miles by 5 miles. I want you to imagine when you drive from beginning of Pleasanton to the end or Danville or Dublin, you're talking about 25 miles by 5 miles. Many of these, San Jose is bigger than Gaza. Santa Clara is bigger than Gaza. Imagine when you're looking at this 25 miles by 5 miles, 1,355 masajid. If Rasulullah sallallahu made dua every salah after the fourth rak'ah, after ruku', dua al-qunut for one month, how long would Rasulullah make dua if he was alive today? And the point of making dua in salah is to remind everyone of the plight that has hit the Muslim community at that time. Every salah, five daily prayers to remind so that the people don't forget. And his dua, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, is powerful. And our dua, with the barakah of being from the followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, has a, has, has a barakah and has power. First thing, we should never stop. Every salah, make dua for the people of Gaza and every other country that you remember. 26 million people right now are hungry in Sudan. The problem is you want to blame Muslims, don't blame Muslims. It's a problem when selling weapons became business. When you sell weapons, you want to create markets. The only market that you can spend weapons in is wars. So we, in order to sell more weapons, we are creating more wars so that we can sell more weapons. This will devastate humanity. We're making bigger and bigger and more faster and, and, and faster weapons. Why? 
because it's a market. Instead of investing in education, healthcare, and make a lot of money from that, and everybody will be educated and healthy and, and good and help people open businesses. A professor from John Hopkins University showed it with mathematical equations, all based on real economics. The money that was spent on the Defense Department in the eight years of George Bush the son was enough to eradicate poverty from planet Earth. Enough to create that if someone wants to see poverty, they have to go to where? They have to go to a museum to see what, how poor people look like. The budget that we spend on these things is incredible. My dear brothers and sisters, this is the short term. One, make dua. Two, donate to the poor. I see and I hear a lot of people, it's a propaganda that is spread to stop us from supporting our brothers and sisters in Palestine and in Gaza. What's the propaganda? Your money will not reach. That is false. And listen to me carefully. This is a well-planned propaganda because the people of Gaza survived until today because of your donation. And the donation of every Muslim around the planet, be it it goes through the United Nation, it still reaches. And it's bothering them to the point two days ago, 120 trucks, instead of sending them to the secure place, they send them to insecure and they leashed, unleashed the gangs on them so that people in Gaza don't eat. Nevertheless, there's local farming, local water, local, you know, means, and your donation does reach to the people of Gaza. That's absolutely the reason why they're not dying by the hundreds of thousands. So, number two, donation. Number three, activism. We are in the center of the world. We are in the Silicon Valley. We are where all the trends in the world start, and then it goes all over the globe. It starts from here. So don't act like as if you're living God knows where and in the middle of nowhere, you know. Uh, you don't live in the middle of nowhere. You live in the most influential place on planet Earth. Actually more influential than Washington, D.C. When you change the opinion of people around you, at this, by this point you should know how to make, say, five to ten sentences explaining something about Palestine without being emotional without saying something racist, without spewing hate, by actually just stating the facts and showing the plights. People want to hear. And people see what's happening. They look at social media. They don't trust social media. They look at you. You are their coworker. You are their neighbor. They trust you. Tell me about it. You cannot, after 14 months, still say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. When are you going to know? When are you going to speak? When are you going to talk? So the third thing is activism, social activism, helping with the poor, connecting with the population. People, Allah created them good. That's our belief as Muslims. Every mawlud, yuladu ala al-fitra, every child is born on pure innate nature. People are good in general. People are good until something happens and they become evil, but originally people are good. So talking, social activism, economical activism, political activism, activism to spread the word and change the public opinion. My dear brothers and sisters, and you know, one of these is actually voting and you know, keep on voting, keep on voting. I don't know, but care, I think for what said that only up to 20, 25% of the total population of voters, Muslim voters in America voted in the last elections. If you're not going to vote now, when are you going to vote? So these are four things. Making dua, giving sadaqah, making activism and voting. This is something that you can do now, today. With no, it does not stop your life. You just need a little bit of education and moving forward. But then we ask, what about the long-term vision? How do we do it? And the answer to that, my dear brothers and sisters, is in the Quran. And it's the most strange thing you will ever think about. When you read Al-Quran Al-Kareem, very soon after reading the stories of one prophet after another, you will find that the stories of the prophets, like there is dark reality, nobody is saying la ilaha illallah, so much zulm, so much oppression, so much, you know, mess, corruption, mischief, you know. And then Allah Azza wa Jal sends a, a, a prophet. Most of the prophets that Allah changed the planet Earth, the surface of the planet, through them, they were actually a story 
of growing, raising, and rising a child. Subhanallah, Nuh, nobody would believe in him. Finally, he turned inwards. Out of four sons, one son went with his mother and did not believe. Three sons, Sam, Ham, and Yafith, they became Muslims and they rode with him in the ship. And Allah made the children of, like you and I today, are the children or one of these three children of Nuh, the second father of humanity. He preserved the deen through raising his children. In the time of Ibrahim salam, Ibn Kathir says that Ibrahim salam and Namrud was like Pharaoh. He saw a dream. He was way before Pharaoh, like by a thousand years. And he saw a dream that one of his, the children of his servants will topple him and, and, and change his kingdom. So he gave an order, kill all the children. One of his servants and the idol makers was the father of Ibrahim salam. They say the mother of Ibrahim did not tell the father that she was pregnant. And she went and delivered him and raised him in a cave. So he was well connected with nature. Never grew up, never saw the asnam and the idols and saw the worship. It didn't pollute his subconscious. So Sayyidina Ibrahim salam grew up and by the time he became Fata, Allah sent to him Jibreel alayhi salam and he started making the da'wah, destroyed the idols. And when they said, who did this? Qalu man fa'ala hadha bi'alihatina. Who did this to our gods? Qalu sami'na fatan yadkuruhum yuqalu lahu Ibrahim. They said, we heard a young man. Fata in Arabic is you have to look enough full body, like 16 years old, all the way to 20, 22 years old. Fata. He started his da'wah as a fata. Ibrahim alayhi salam goes, makes da'wah from Iraq with Ur, where he was born and raised, goes all the way to Huran after he debates an Namrud, debates the king, they throw him in the fire because he destroyed the idols. He comes safe and sound out of the fire. He leaves the whole Iraq and he goes to another region south of Syria, Huran. He feeds people who worship the idols. They don't believe he goes to Egypt. In Egypt, there is malicious king who try to rape our mother, Sarah. Sarah, she makes dua and Allah liberates her from that king. He goes back and settles in Palestine. Now, the number of believers are four. Ibrahim and Sarah, until they were in Egypt. When they left Egypt and settled in Palestine, in the city of Al-Khalil, half an hour far from Jerusalem, Ibrahim salam and Sarah. Now they have a third believer, Hajar. She came with them from Egypt. And the fourth believer is Lut alayhi salam. Lut, Allah sends him to Gomorrah and Sidum, which is the Dead Sea area right now. No one would believe in him, not even his wife, but it was raising a child. Only his daughters believed in him. And Allah saved him and saved his daughters. Ibrahim alayhi salam complains to Allah, if people are not listening to me, give me children that will listen. I will raise them with Islam because no one seems to accept. I will raise them. And Ya Allah, make, bring many Muslims from them. Allah grants him Ismail. And Ismail have 12 children called Al-Asbat. And Allah Azza wa Jal from one of this oldest child, Qidar, comes Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and look at you and I from the children of Ismail. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the ways he addressed us in the hadith, Ya Bani Ismail, O children of Ismail. Irmu Bani Ismail, fa inna abakum kana ramiya. <coughs> My dear brothers and sisters from Ismail, from Is Allah, Sarah, Allah gave her Ishaq. And when Warai is Haq, Ya'qub. Ya'qub is Israel. And Allah gave Israel 12 children. They're also called Al-Asbat. And from the 12 children rises a child, Yusuf alayhi salam. And now the world changes. The change that you and I want to see, global, superpower, government policy change, when does it happen? On the hands of Yusuf, man number two in Egypt, which means man, man number two in the world. Because Egypt used to run the world at that time for thousands of years. But it took raising a child, after raising a child, after Ishaq, Yaqub, Yusuf, then you see the fruits. You look at the story at the time of Musa alayhi salam, the Israelites are in the worst time of believers. They're ch the declared policy, kill their sons, Keep the mothers alive so that they can bear for us more children. And how does Allah change this dark reality for the believers? They're saying, La ilaha illallah. They are enslaved. And as if slavery is not humiliating enough, devastating enough, 
you see your own children killing under your eyes through a government policy that you cannot change. How difficult can it be? How does Allah change this dark, dark, dark reality? Way much darker than Gaza today. Allah raises a child. Take Musa alayhi salam, grow him in the house of the Pharaoh, then take him until he's 30, takes him and cleans him up in the house of Shu'aib, whether it's Shu'aib alayhi salam or another man named Shu'aib, he marries his daughter, become a shepherd, loses all the characteristics that he gained in the house of the Pharaoh, becomes humble, godly, connected with Allah through nature, then Allah sends Jibreel alayhi salam and Allah speaks to Musa directly. When Allah Azza wa Jal wanted to change the reality at the time of the Romans when they were ruling Palestine and the Israelites were under occupation at that time, how does Allah change reality? Imran and his wife cry to Allah, Ya Allah help us, how can we change this? Grant us a child that we can dedicate to you. قالت ربي إني نذرت ملك ما في بطني محررة فتقبل مني. So Allah, instead of granting a son, He grants her a daughter. And the story of Maryam is like the story of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Her father died before her birth, and by six years old or even younger, her mother dies. She moves with her khala, the wife of is is Zakaria alayhi salam, and she grows up raised by a prophet. The project of changing the world starts with raising a child. And then Zakaria sees how righteous is this girl. She's in her early teens, 13, 14, 15. He starts crying to Allah, Ya Allah, you granted Imran and his wife, a 93 years old, married to an 83 years old, and you grant them Maryam. I've been crying my whole life, and I know you can grant me. Ya Zakaria, inna nubashiruka bi ghulamin ismuhu Yahya. Allah grants him Yahya. So now Zakaria is raising Yahya. His wife, Elizabeth, is raising Yahya. And then the Maryam is also participating in raising Yahya. And then finally, the dua of Imran and his wife. We want a boy to change the world. But Allah knew Imran is not going to live. His wife is going to live. If you want a special, special, special boy, you first need special, special, special mother. So Allah brought the mother first, Maryam. And then Maryam had Isa. So the boy came but a second generation because we need a plan just like Ibrahim then Ishaq then Yaqub then now Yusuf comes Imran Maryam Yahya Isa now comes and this project that we don't see as a solution to the world's problem what does raising a child have to do with the world economics world politics world social order world change what does it have to do we're talking about a child if you want to know what it has to do read the Quran and see Allah's sunnah in his creation. May Allah Azza wa Jal grant us of our spouses and our children a pleasure to our eyes and make us lil muttaqina imama as Allah taught us at the end of Surah Al-Furqan to make that dua. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Aqulu ma tasma'una wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiruna wa lakum. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم يا مسبب الأسباب سبب لنا أسباب الخير يا رب العالمين My dear brothers and sisters when you read the story of Isa you realize the hidden story in the back a story of a community Imran and his wife Zakaria and his wife Maryam Yahya and number seven is Isa there was a community and they had a group of believers around them that's exactly what we do here in the Islamic centers. Together, we raise our children. That's why, inshallah, the time of khutbah is short and it's meant for tadkira and maw'idah. But inshallah, tonight, inshallah, and tomorrow, we have like a workshop and this where we can indulge ourselves and see what can we do towards our children. Even if your child is 22 and 24 and 25, you still have something. Many of the parents say, my child are grown up, they don't listen to me. You can actually make them listen to you. But you need to know, you need to have the Quranic and the prophetic wisdom. You need to learn how to talk. Learn from the Master, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. And you will have the honor to change yourself to be like him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. So my dear brothers and sisters, even Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah raised him himself, took the father away. So Rasulullah doesn't learn anything directly from his father because it's all jahiliya. Allah took the mother away. Then the grandfather 
was also very established in the traditions. Two years, Allah took him away. Then Allah put him in the house of Abu Talib. Abu Talib is the leader of Quraysh, has 10 children, so busy, did not spend so much time one-on-one -on -one teaching Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but he was an honorable man. Rasulullah saw Abu Talib feeding the hujjaj and coming home hungry. After feeding the world, coming home hungry. He saw that with his own eyes and that impacted him. The Abu Talib had so much honor. And then Allah raises Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his own ways. And then Rasulullah grows, gets married to Khadija at age 25. And Rasulullah raises two children in his house before his own children. Zayd ibn Haritha, who was gifted to Khadija as a marriage gift, as a slave. Rasulullah treated him like a son from day one. No slaves. And number two, he went to Abu Talib, took Ali ibn Abi Talib and raised him in his house. So Ali became a copy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Allah sent the wahi to the Prophet, the raising of the children paid off. First, believer, a woman, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Second, believer, a 10 years old who did not hit puberty, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Third, believer, a, a teenager, Zayd ibn Haritha, that was a slave and became like a son to the Prophet ﷺ. How does the prospects look to you? A woman, a child, and a slave. What are the prospects? It, there's not much hope. But look, you and I come out of these three people. The second day, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq, the first adult male that embraces Islam, radiyallahu anhu wa ardah. And the rest is history. We have to start. We, we cannot like jump, but it's going to take a generation or two and three. But if we're doing what Allah showed us to do, you will see the change in the world that you are trying to see. And you're so frustrated that is not happening now, today, right here, right now. Let's not forget there is things that we can do now. Dua, the donation, activism and speaking the truth and there is things that we have to do over generations and there is no alternative to that instead of b the discussion being how can we save our kids from being lost in america let us change the discussion to how can our kids be the leaders let's not be on the defense let's go on the offense let's see what allah has taught us through the quran and sunnah and the examples of the prophets inshallah that's what we intend to do over the weekend may allah azza wa jal make the situation in gaza better ya rabbal alameen may allah give them peace and security may allah give them peace and security and aman ya rabbal alameen allah 